Did anyone not get wrapped? Okay. <laughs> That's a better question. <laughs> yeah. All right. <clears throat> okay. So, welcome everybody. I am so glad that you're here. This is. Um, I think I, I might say this every month, but I think this is my favorite topic. I've really dug deep into this, and so. Um, the things that we're going to be talking about tonight, um, if you have questions, go ahead and raise your hands. I'm going to be talking very fast. There's a lot of information that we're going to be going through tonight. Um, so, but we're here to make sure that you get your questions answered, so make sure and answer and ask those questions. Now, where I really want to start out with this is we're going to be talking tonight about getting 15 pounds healthier. So I don't want to put the emphasis on weight loss, but, but body composition and how to get your body so that it's more healthy. Right? Because everybody's got different body types, but we need to look at how you can be the healthiest you. So what we're gonna look at is the best place to start with any of these is to really understand what your objectives are. So there's a few things that we need. How you eat, how you move, and how you think. And we're gonna dive into each one of those tonight. But where I really like to start out with, just like we do when somebody comes into the office for an initial consultation or for an examination, we wanna start out with what is your objective? So this is really where everything, where the rubber hits the road, because if your objective is to just lose weight, then that's one idea. But if you actually want to get healthier and have sustainable weight loss and, and make diet style and lifestyle changes, then it's a different path. So what we want to look at is really understanding what it is. Do you want to lose weight? Do you want to avoid disease? Right? Do you want to increase your strength or speed? We want to increase performance or capacity or function or create optimal health, right? So I want you guys all to just take a, take a moment and just think about where you are, what you want. And it might not be on this list, right? But becoming 15 pounds healthier can mean a lot of different things to many different people. And that's where we need to start. We need to start with getting what your objective is. So we're going to dive right in. Now, do you guys think that we live in a healthy country or a sick country? What do you think? And, and why, do you, why do you say that? Give me a couple ideas. Right, yeah, I think that's, that's a simple way to put it, right? Well, to put it into numbers, because I'm kind of a numbers guy, what we look at is if we look at the health of our country from 40 different countries, the 40 top industrialized countries, if we fell at number 10, we might be like, okay, that makes sense, right? If we fell at 20, we might be like, no, oh, that's not very good. If we fell at 30, we, we'd kind of be pissed off, right? But guess where we fall? <laughs> Lower than 40? Yeah, we're, we're at 40. 38 and 40 is back and forth between those, right? So are we healthy, right? And we need to start out with the definition of health. And we look at things like optimum health. Health is everywhere, wellness is everywhere. But what does it mean? What does it mean to you? Is it to feel good? Because we are six, five to six percent of the world's population in the United States, and we take 45% of all the world's drugs. So if health is feeling good, we take a lot of drugs, and what do drugs do? They're supposed to make you feel good, so we should be darn healthy, right? But what we want to look at health as, as either a crisis, because we're good at handling crisis, like our crisis hospitals, things like that, our doctors do an awesome job. We just do a very poor job at teaching health from the ground up. We let the TV teach us health, which is coming from what? Big food companies and pharmaceutical companies, right? So we're getting our information from the sellers. So it goes back to what you said, Molly. So we need to understand what that, what that true health is, where we wanna go. Our mission here is to really educate and adjust people toward optimum health through natural chiropractic care. Now that means a lot of different things. In the beginning, many people come here with pain. They come here with irritation. They come here with things that they are not able to get over on their own, so we want to help them get through that. But people stay because of the things that we teach them over time, how we can keep the nervous system functioning the right way, right? Because the nervous system is the master control system, and it controls everything. So when we go back to diet, if we eat meat and we, we have the wrong enzymes coming out of our salivary glands and into our stomach, that meat's not going to dissolve and it's not going to be digested properly, right? So we need to have proper communication everywhere, whether it's in a workplace, whether it's in a relationship, or whether it's within our own body, right? And that's what chiropractic really helps to do with that. So we're gonna dive in, and we're gonna go over a lot of stuff tonight. So again, make sure and stop me if I go too fast. 
So we talk about what is optimal health. Again, we like to have measurements of this, right? Is optimum health just standing on the scale and being lighter? No. Right? No, right? We, got, we have different biomarkers. We always want to measure these things. We want to have tests. We want to have increasing performance. But increasing performance, what does that mean? We have to have a baseline for what performance is, right? We need to have a, a healthy appearance, right? We need to have improved function over all those biomarkers. So look good, feel great, and function better, right? So I think that's a better quick slogan of health. Is, is to really, this part is I think the biggest part, but how do we measure that, right? Those are some of the things that we're gonna talk into. So, this, so it kind of made me sick, really. I was walking through the mall at Christmas time, and I saw a sign, and it said, skinny is the new sexy. And what an image to give to our young people. What an image to give to anybody, right? It was for skinny jeans, so I get the idea. But, that, but what does that put into people, right? What I'm, what I'm trying to do is, is start a movement that says healthy is the new sexy. Healthy doesn't need to be skinny. Healthy, we have many different body types which we're gonna talk about tonight. And healthy in different body types doesn't look the same, right? But I think healthy is the new sexy and we need to get behind that and really understand what that is, right? Just like a couple of other things I'm gonna give you tonight. But the, we're, gonna t we're gonna dive into the brutal facts now. I'm not, a, I, I don't think of a lot of original ideas, but I like to lean on people who do. So we're gonna look at circulation from 2008, one of the top journals in the entire world. What they talk about is the present obesity epidemic is both troubling and informative. Because adiposity, or adipose um, and, and obesity, is largely caused by poor diet, excessive calories, and inadequate physical activity, Emphasis on more downstream risk factors such as hypertension, dyslipidemia, and diabetes address neither the root causes of obesity nor its full cardiovascular consequences. So what's this saying? This is saying that we're looking at all these different diseases and we're treating these different diseases, but we're not actually treating the root cause. What's the root cause? The root cause is obesity and our body's not functioning right. right? The brutal facts and abundance of evidence suggest that lifestyle factors, including exposure to chemical carcinogens, physical inactivity, and diet play major roles in the development of common cancers. The current human diet contains a variety of mutagens and carcinogens that lead to the initiation of cancer and other chronic diseases. Now this is coming out of the Journal of Applied Physiology. Right? We're, looking at, we're looking at big journals talking about these things. Now the interesting thing is even when this came out, we were talking, and I'm not going to dive deep into this because this is a whole different lecture, but our genes, we were saying the genes are in, that's the problem with everything. Once we find out the fat gene, the cancer gene, then we're going to be able to take care of it, that. But what did they find out? Genes have a very little effect. Our lifestyle, our epigenetics, the way that our body can change, the way that our body can react to our environment has a bigger change. Because you can have 100 people who have a breast cancer gene and zero out of 100 get it, right? Because they're doing the right things with their lifestyle. Right? But like I said, that's a whole other lecture, so I'm not going to dive into that tonight. The prevalence of overweight U.S. adults has increased dramatically during the past 30 years, with type 2 diabetes representing what is perhaps the most serious obesity-related consequence. Nearly 90% of individuals with type 2 diabetes are overweight. Now, did you know that they changed this for, to type 2 diabetes? It used to be called adult-onset diabetes, but now we have so many kids that are getting diabetes, right? But they, we literally have to change the name because they're not adults, right? So obesity, downstream conditions. This is gonna lead to heart disease. It's gonna lead to diabetes. It's gonna lead to cancer, right? So what we need to look at is fat is sick, okay? Fat equals sick. We need to really understand that that's the baseline of what we're gonna be looking at, right? And we're gonna understand how we've been driven to that through the, the type of lights that are around us, to the physical activity that we have, to the things that we eat. So we're gonna talk through a lot of these things. So obesity is literally the linchpin in chronic disease. So that's how obesity makes us sick. You're gonna understand how it's the linchpin, and if we can change that, we can change the life, right? So what people are currently doing <laughs> is not working, would you agree? This is not just the United States. You look into Canada, we're starting to see the same thing. You're looking at all countries because now we're starting to get these big food con 
conglomerates that are going into every place, right? And it's really what's driving a lot of this, right? And it's ease and it's convenience. So stop, fat is a symptom. So right, so we, didn't I just say that fat was the cause of all these things? Well, fat is only a symptom. Fat is a symptom of the different things that are going on in a person, right? So it's not, it's, it's, it's kind of a disease just like heart disease or anything else. So chronic hormone imbalance, we're gonna get into this because this is a huge issue and this is what leads to that fat. I mean, how many times do we talk to somebody and they say, I'm eating all the right things, I'm only eating salads, I'm just doing, you know, I'm doing small things and I still can't lose weight. Well, it's because our hormones have gotten out of balance. Our hormones are not functioning the right way. So adiposity, extra body fat, is a symptom of chronic hormone imbalance. When something becomes chronic, is it easy to turn around? It's not, right? So hormones and enzymes regulate fat storage. You must regain hormone balance through specific lifestyle changes and choices that directly impact hormone balance if you ever wish to conquer the weight and health issues that we have right now. So we're really living in the perfect storm, and this is with the perfect hormone storm, right? Because what we have is we've got a toxic deficient diet where we're eating out of boxes or from windows, right? We've got an energy imbalance, which is a sedentary life plus excessive calories, right? Now we try to add chronic social stress, right? Let's just back up a little bit. How many people think that today, right now in our life, is more stressful than it was 10 years ago? Is there anybody who has less stress now than they had 10 or 20 years ago? Okay, not, not that usual, right? We're, we have devices in our hands that are computers that used to have to take up an entire room 30 years ago, right? So we're expected to be on our email, we're expected to be in touch all the time, right? So lack of sleep, chronic exhaustion, these things all play into everything we're looking at. So we're gonna talk about the toxic and deficient food choices, right? This is, this is where we're seeing sugar put into everything for taste, right? We're eating out of boxes. You know, we're gonna talk about what the human, how we actually evolved. And we haven't really had m almost 90% of the foods that we're eating today are not in our, we're not genetically made to eat those, right? Grains only came into the human diet 10,000 years ago. Grains came into our diet 10,000 years ago, but they were, even then they were very inefficient to eat because in order to grind down a bush bushel of wheat, per se, it takes a lot of energy where you could kill a rabbit and you could live on a rabbit for 10 days, right? So we start looking at some of these things. So how do we regain control of your hormones? We have to look at different things. We have to look at food quality. We have to look at food quantity. We have to look at the rhythms that we go through with our food, right? Activity levels, social stress, sleep patterns. So we're gonna dive into all these things. So the top five dieting lies, and these are other pieces that we're gonna jump into, right? And if, you, and if anything here looks familiar, say, amen, that's mine, right? And that's okay to do. So we look at the top one, right? Weight problems run in my family, right? How many of us have said that? Just eat less and you'll lose weight. How do we like that? I'll just work it off at the gym. You know, we got, we, this is a great one, right? We go to the gym, we work out, we burn 500 calories, and then we go to get a Frappuccino that's 700. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, that's how, the, that's how they get you, right? So, calories are calories, right? These are all the lies, right? Sleep has nothing to do with it, right? We're gonna talk about some things that kind of buck some of the things you may have heard before, maybe some of these things. A lot of people always are going to say, hallelujah, amen. This is what I've been living with for, you know, for a long time, and it's because of these things. But we're going, to, we're going to dive into that. So big lie number one, we're going to talk into weight problems that run in my family, right? So we're going to look at this Venn diagram. Anybody, everybody know what a Venn diagram is? It's these three circles, and the perfect spot is right in the middle where we're getting a little bit of all of them, right? So what we're looking at is we're looking at body composition. So we look at genes, we look at environment, we look at lifestyle. Okay, so each one of these balls, that's where it ends up. Perfect body composition is right where all of them meet up, right in here. Okay, so we're going to look at genes. So genes, we got those from mom and dad. So, so how much of those are we really going to change our base down genes? 
We're not, right? We can have epigenetic conversations, and I love that subject, and I can talk for hours on that because it's so cool, but we're not going to. Um, but our genes, we cannot change. We can, we can choose how our genes are expressed through these other two things. Our environment, our environment we kind of set up, but we're somewhat at the mercy of our environments as well on some levels, right? For example, we're living in the most toxic environment that the human being has ever lived in right now because of the chemicals in the world, right? That are on our food, that are in our streets, that are in our air, right? Lifestyle, it really comes down to the one that we can control the most is our lifestyle. We can control our local environment, which we're gonna talk about when we get to sugar. But in general, the environment's a hard thing to control, but we have 100% control over our lifestyle. So that's what I want, that's what we're gonna think about. We're gonna, I want you to kind of think about this through that lens because we can't change these other two that much. We can't change this one at all. We can change this one just a little, okay? So this is a huge one. So these are obesity trends, okay? Now what I want you to do is I want you to think all the way back, all the way back to 1990, okay? Don't tell me what you were doing then, but it's not that long ago, right? 30 years ago. This graph on the far left is the United States in 1990, as far as obesity. Now, maybe I, I gotta stop and define obesity. So obesity is having over 33% body fat, okay? Over 33% body fat is what's considered obesity. So, that's what this is all on. So 1990, everybody, in the United States was under 19, no, this is not body fat, under 19% of people were obese in 1990, okay? Um, and most places in the West were under 14, under 14% 14 of the population was obese. So what happens in 2006? Isn't that a dramatic change? There's only one it upgraded a little bit, but it still stayed in the blue. Another one stayed in the blue. <laughs> right? Who knows? Right? We're going to talk about some things that happened. <clears throat> Our foods completely changed in 1996. So we had a big change that happened there, which could explain a 10-year period of change. 1998, right? We saw this jump here. So in 1998, things were still, things were still okay. I mean, there was a few that were getting out of control, but in 2006, this is here, and if we had the information today, then this would still be going up. This is disturbing, right? Super disturbing. What can happen over a 16-year period of time that changes an entire population that much? So this is, uh, this is a gal who brought her auntie in, and this gal was an athlete equestrian. She had lost about, she became about 30 pounds um, healthier. And she brought her auntie in, and her auntie became 100 pounds healthier. So the body ch changes, right? Now she might have lost 150 pounds of fat, but she's gonna gain muscle, because that's an important part of what we talk about, right? So what changed? So we know that the gene, genes didn't change. We know the environment changed a little bit, but lifestyle, we need to eat, move, and think well. We need to think about environments, our relationships, and, str and strategies and choices that we're making on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So healthy, and, and I think this is one of my favorite parts, because healthy comes in all sizes. There's endomorphic people, which are the short, stocky, wide people, right? There are exomorphs that are super tall, the tall drink of water, six foot, that are skinny no matter what they do. Right? And then there's the mesomorphs who just look at weights and they put on muscle, right? And there's combinations of all of these, right? But there's a healthy for each one of those, right? So that, what that means is that an endomorph, right, is going to, if they are not careful, they're gonna gain weight more quickly, right? But an exomorph, they could be eating really horrible crap and they could look great, but they have a heart attack the next day. Dr. Leah's dad had a couple brothers who were like this. They looked super healthy, and they were the first ones to die of heart attacks because they would eat whatever they wanted because guess what? They were skinny, so if I look good, I must be healthy, right? So you gotta be careful on any one of these, right? But there's a healthy in all of these positions, right? 
you're, not all of us are meant to be supermodels, super skinny, right? We're supposed to, there's a healthy weight for everybody. There's a healthy body composition. And that's why we're gonna talk about body composition. When we start the process, you wanna start looking at weight, like waist size, right? We wanna start looking at percentages of body fat. We wanna look at toxicities that are in our system, right? We wanna look at the things that can be measured. We don't necessarily wanna get married to a scale. Scales are dangerous. Half the time we can throw them away because you could have lost 10 pounds of fat and gained 11 pounds of muscle and it looks like you gained a pound and you get frustrated, right? So you gotta be very careful with some of those things, especially as you're making the changes as you go along. Not just the eating choices, but the, the moving choices, the thinking choices, all these different pieces, right? So, so healthy comes in all sizes and we need, to keep that, we need to keep that in our mind. So 15 pounds healthier. So what we look at is body composition. So we wanna look at the amount of lean tissue versus the amount of fatty tissue. There are optimal ranges of what these are supposed to be. Women are a bit higher, right? Because what? Because God is good, right? Because he, he's, a, he's, the, he's a molder. He helps, he helps it so women are gonna have children. They need to have more fat. If we look at body fat composition, men to be ultra lean, super lean would be 8%, right? Up to 15% is kind of in that lower normal range, right? Women start at 12%, up to 23%. This is like in optimum shape when you're in this position, right? So this is gonna look different for an endomorph compared to an exomorph, okay? It's gonna look completely different on those people. That's why we wanna look at some of these, some of these pieces, the optimal ranges. Biomarkers, so is scale, right? Scale is gonna be part of the equation, but it's not all of it, right? We gotta be careful with that. Abdominal measurements, the body fat composition, these are things that we, can, that we can measure and we can really help and start to understand how our body's actually functioning. And these are the things that help us so that we can have a positive outlook, stay in the game, and really understand what's happening. So big line number two, just eat less and you'll lose weight, right? So it's a simple equation, calories in equals calories out, but not really, right? And we can get to a point where you can starve yourself for a certain period of time, but what happens at the end of that period of time? Yeah, yeah. 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 yep, exactly. You, you lose 30 and you gain 35, right? So we start to have a problem with that. So it's unsustainable. It's kind of like breathing, right? <laughs> okay, so if you're breathing, and just say you, that you need to have 20 breaths per, per minute, and you just say, ah, I think I'm just gonna do 14, <laughs> right? How long is that gonna last? Not long. It's not gonna last long. You can't do it. Your body, our bodies are a furnace. We need fuel, right? Our bodies are very efficient furnaces, which is what's gonna frustrate us in just a minute because we put on weight relatively quickly, especially if we have hormone imbalances, but we burn it relatively slow, which is a really good thing as far as survival goes, right? But we look at unsus being unsustainable. Metab metabolic changes, so food deprivation, our bodies are smart, right? We talked about this, our bodies are super smart. Our bodies know what to do. So if we starve ourselves, guess what our body does? It says, hey, I'm just gonna turn down the thermostat here, we're gonna slow it down, and we're gonna live off of what we need to, right? So then that starts to, starts to cause a gap, right? It starts to cause a cap, I guess, on top of that. So we go into survival mode, survival, <coughs> What we need to do, so what we want to do, like you said, survival, what's our, what are we meant to do on this planet? We're meant to survive and reproduce. So it makes it so that we can survive and reproduce, right? That's what happens in survival mode. Short-term to torture, this is where we have the short-term torture. We do great, we get to that number on the scale, woohoo! <laughs> and then we go back to what we did before, right? <laughs> So what happens? Then we just end up the same way, but we yo-yo. And what happens when you yo-yo? It's not that you go down and then back up. It's like you go down and up and down and up and down and up, and you end up just getting this big line that keeps going up, right? I saw it happen with my mom because she would always do the newest diet, but then just go back to whatever she was eating before, right? It doesn't work. So big line number three, calories are calories. I think this is my, my favorite one to talk about, my least favorite one to hear. It doesn't matter what the calories are. Calorie in is a calorie in. Calories are handled by our body completely differently, right? This is what we talked about a little bit earlier. So let's talk about this. The perfect hormonal storm. Toxic food choices. 
Again, I'm not going to go into this too deep. I do this in another workshop, but, but GMO foods, right? Does anybody, does, everybody, does anybody not know what GMO foods are or understand them very well? Okay, that's good. Um, but if you do, talk to me because, because it's important. GMO <coughs> foods are genetically modified organisms, okay? And it's, it, the debate is out there whether genetically modified foods are safe and efficacious, but we know that the reason why they do the genetic modification is really so we can spray poison on an entire crop and, and then still have the food that we want to eat, right? The classic example is down in Chile, they have huge soybean fields, right? And so what they've done is they've gone into the genes and they've spliced it so that they can be sprayed with glyphosate, which is Roundup, and that the soybeans don't die, but everything around them does, right? Cancer went up in Chile 90% two years after they started doing that in Chile, right? So, but we get clean soybeans and we don't have to go and, and spray for weeds, right? The same thing happened with corn, because corn, what happens with corn? It, you, what, what, why do we peel the ear back on corn? We see if a bug's in there eating it, right? What they did is they spliced the gene BT, which is a bug toxin that eats the, the bug's stomach from the inside out, is in all industrialized corn. Okay, so if you're not eating organic corn, that's what you're eating. And BT is in that corn, and now when the bugs eat that corn, now the bugs die because it's just like when they used to spray for the bugs, right? So then that's starting to affect leaky gut. We're starting to see a lot of those different things because corn is also not, it's, it's not something, it's got anti-nutrients in it as well, which we talked about in our IBS workshop that is really what breaks apart the gut wall and creates some of the leaky gut. But then add on to top of that the toxins. Now our wheat is desiccated almost 100%. So wheat, what that means is we have a field of wheat and we used to wait for till spring or till fall came and the sun started getting less and then the wheat would die and then we'd harvest it, right? And that's just the natural way. But now they can get two crops a year by growing the wheat to as high as it needs to go, spraying the whole thing with glyphosate or Roundup, letting it die, harvesting it, and then planting a new, a new crop, right? So that's what we're dealing with. Not just gluten intolerance, it's the way that we um, adulterate some of our foods, right? So we're getting toxic food choices. We're getting the Cheetos. We're giving our kids, I mean, I can't, we see these little kids walking around with a bag full of Cheerios and a fruit juice, right? Fruit juice is straight sugar. It's, it's fructose, right? And if we're having those all the time, we're throwing our kids, we're setting them up for that hormonal imbalance of insulin, which we're getting to. So some of these things will make a little bit more sense in a minute. Um, but sedentary lifestyle, we add on to that sedentary lifestyle. 80% of people that come into the office sit more than they stand at work, right? They sit more than they walk. More of their day is spent sitting, right? We have social stress. So again, there's social stress. Facebook, I can't imagine growing up right now as a child. Think about the stress that the kids have with um, some of the social media, some of the things that they have that are just interwound. I didn't, I didn't grow up with that, and I can't imagine what would have happened if I did, right? I know that um, I wouldn't have wanted me vid myself video. So, so building a pyramid. So this is, this is another one of the big lies that we've been talked about. The food pyramid, I mean, take a look at this food pyramid. What's on the bottom? It's all the things that are incongruent with the way that our bodies are supposed to live. What's up on top? We've got chocolate, right? I mean, we literally have a food group for chocolate. We have a dairy food group, right? I mean, we've got the things that we should be eating here and here, so we've got three of them. And oils and fats are good, right? But we're putting so much, there's so many different things, and you know, the, the, the food pyramid, the four food groups started around the time of the Great Depression. Now, we could probably argue that maybe it caused the Great Depression. Just kidding. But, <laughs> but there's been more and more iterations of the food pyramid, right? And it just keeps changing. I mean, how many people are sick of these things changing, right? An egg is bad, an egg is gonna cause cholesterol. Oh wait, egg is the perfect food, right? We're going through all these different pieces. Milk does a body good. Oh, but it makes your body acidic and actually leaches more calcium from your bones that it actually put in. Oh, we didn't hear that commercial though, yeah. right? So we start to see a lot of these things that the body doesn't, it just doesn't work well with. So we look at the wild hunter-gatherer. Now, why do we look at the wild hunter-gatherer? Why is this kind of the, the gold standard that we look at? Well, it's because this is a time when people did not have disease. People were dying of heart disease and cancer. You know, 
we didn't have the opportunity to save them when they got hit by a saber-toothed tiger, right? But they were living healthy. And over here is the industrialized modern human, right? So what do we see over here? High refined carbohydrates, right? So these are cereals, these are breads, these are different things that are refined carbohydrates that have, that have been adulterated, right? Low fat, low protein, no red meat, right? This is another thing that's kind of gone around. And they always said no red meat is going to cause heart disease. But now we're finding that red meat, if it's raised properly, grass fed, grass finished, it's as good for you as salmon is, right? And less toxic, perhaps. Sugar, everything in moderation, right? So when we go over to the wild hunter gatherer, what do we have? High carbohydrate. Now people say, wait, high carbohydrate, what do you mean? Well, they're eating tubers, right? They're eating legumes. They're eating, um, they're eating, you know, different things depending on where they are. Taro. Um, we have low to moderate good fat, so we're trying to upgrade the fat. And I say, uh, in that moderate phase, is really where you you should be if you're having the right fats, right? High protein. No refined foods. So we're taking this one right out of it. So the high carbohydrates. This is a this is a great one. So you know the um, falafels that were out there today. Those are a great one. They've got pretty high carbohydrates, right? But they're, but they're made from garbanzo beans. There's no refinement in them. Those are garbanzo beans that are ground down after they're cooked and then they're put into patties. No dairy and no sugar. So the results are in. Where should we be? So, poor quality food fails. These are toxic choices. They're deficient choices. We're not getting the, the vitamins, the minerals, the nutrients in our food. As a matter of fact, it's actually stealing them. You're gonna notice that most people in this practice, we recommend to take magnesium. Now, there's an underlying reason, not only that you're getting symptoms of muscle cramping, not being able to sleep, these kind of things, but what happens is glyphosate that we were talking about that gets sprayed on nearly everything that we test in our food, even the organic wines out of Napa Valley test for positive for glyphosate because of the runoff and things. Um, so glyphosate is actual a mineral chelator in our systems. So we're seeing ginormous mineral and uh, or mineral and especially magnesium deficiencies in people who are not eating organic. So we're seeing a lot of that happen. Unbalanced choices. So hormonally unbalanced equals higher glycemic load. Now let's dive into this. So we're going to talk about hormonal impact. So there's, we're only going to talk about three hormones tonight, and mostly the top one. We're going to talk about insulin, glucagon, and cortisol. Okay. Now hormone, what I want to say is that every time that I say insulin, I want you guys to say fat storage hormone. Ready? Insulin. Fat storage hormone. All right. Okay. Insulin. Fat storage hormone. Okay. Perfect. So what does insulin do? Fat storage hormone. That's right. Exactly. So <laughs> elevated insulin locks you fat. into fat storage hormone. Right? So. We're gonna talk about that and what insulin is. Everybody's heard of insulin, right? So insulin's what diabetics have to take um, because their pancreas is not producing that, right? So insulin's not a bad thing, but it is with the type of diet that we're having because insulin does what? Okay, that's right, so it stores fat, right? And that's a good thing, especially if you're a hunter-gatherer and it is fall going into winter. Right? We want to make sure that we're getting as much of that stuff stored as possible. So we're going to talk about that. What causes elevated insulin? Sugar. Hmm. Sugars and refined carbohydrates. So we call these fast carbs. These are carbs that are literally like backing a fire truck up to your mouth of energy and pouring it in. Right? Our body doesn't have the opportunity to use that energy fast enough. So what does it do? That's right. It throws insulin. Best All right, <laughs> into our bloodstream, and then it tells it to store that energy, right? Dairy does the same thing, usually pretty high in, in sugars, um, unless you're having like, like heavy cream. So when I usually have dairy, we usually have heavy cream, because then that, it's just a high enough fat to where, it's, to where it is not quite as bad. It's still not the greatest thing, but it will still cause some acidity. Energy imbalance, so excess calories, right? So too many calories, overeating, right? This is a big one. 
Like, I love to eat. I was known as the garbage disposal when I was growing up. So it was, uh, it, it, it worked. But I, I burned off a lot of energy, though. Um, and then the sedentary lifestyle, under moving. So we're going to talk about that as well. But the elevated insulin is what we're going to be focusing on now. So what is the glycemic index, right? It tells us how our body's insulin, or blood sugar, is affected when we eat certain foods. So on your left is what happens when we have, a, when we have sugar, when we have just straight sugar, glucose, okay? So this is where we come up, comes up to 100, and then that's where it peaks out and it comes down. So that's what we would consider 100%. Now lentils, you eat lentils and it comes up to 30%. So what did I say? Insulin's not a bad thing, right? The glycemic, blood, the blood sugar levels, they, they have to go up, right? We have to have the, the sugar in our blood but it's just how our body responds. Can you see with the lentils, we have the peak, but then we've got a big long tail where the energy holds up, right? Whereas over here, we've got this peak and then we've got a ginormous drop down. If any of you have kids who've eaten sugar, you've seen this before, right? So subjects eat amount of food containing 50 or 25 grams. Over two hour period, blood glucose is measured, right? On a graph, the response of test food is compared to reference value above. So that's where we can get the, the um, glycemic index of a food. So high glycemic index foods. Sorry. Okay, here we go. So we're gonna. So you guys are gonna have this etched in your mind forever. So almost all refined grains have high glycemic indexes. So that's an easy thing to remember, right? So rice check cereals. So it's gluten free, but guess what? It's got the highest. It's got 89, almost as high as when you're taking a spoonful of sugar. Corn flakes, right? Plus, we've got the toxins that are in there. Pretzels, Rice crispy cereal, rice cakes, rye bread. Many of these things we look at being healthy, right? Waffles, total cereal, total? I thought total was health food. Graham crackers, Cheerios, bagels, but not with cream cheese on it, right? <laughs> Even with cream cheese. Short grain white rice, corn chips, white bread, Wheat bread, what? Whole wheat bread, I thought that was healthy. Oh, it's seven, white bread 70, whole wheat's only 69. But uh, oh, guess what? Wheat bread also has more of the anti-nutrients, the leptins, that actually go into our stomach and make it so we can't digest. So just to step, just to like step into one, because I'm really having a hard time not doing this. Um, just to <laughs> talk about the anti-nutrients that I've mentioned a couple of times, right? What are, what are grains? Grains are seeds, right? What is a seed's only job on this planet? To reproduce, right? So they have anti-nutrients surrounding the outside. Gluten is one of those anti-nutrients, right? And so what happens is it's meant to go through our system, like has anybody eaten corn and then seen the toilet the next day? Yeah, yeah. It looks the same, right? Because those grains are meant to go through our system and survive on the other end and be able to grow again. Right? So they have anti-nutrients surrounding them, so our digestive system cannot break them down. Over time, and we talk, we dive deep into this in the IBS um, uh, workshop, but that's what starts to rip apart some of, the, um, some of the bowels, and we start to see more leaky gut. Right? So I had to jump into that because that explains part of the whole wheat bread. And yeah, whole wheat might be a little bit better. There are some nutrients in it, but you know, if you're just eating wheat, you don't get the nutrients. It's all the stuff that they add to it, right? So, refined sugars, grains, and vegetables. So, this is looking at, at what food, so what it's saying is 70% of the calories that we eat today were not even available in the hunter-gatherer days or in any hunter-gatherer tribes. 70% of the food is not built to be in your body, right? We look at dairy, grains, refined vegetable oils. Refined vegetable oils are the worst thing for you. You gotta get rid of the canola, even if it's organic. You gotta get rid of it. The oils that need to be used are coconut oil, uh, avocado oil, olive oil, and palm oil. Other ones clog up your cell membranes. We do full detoxes on true cellular detox to help clean out the cell membranes so the body can actually start to function and the cells can start to function and get an upgraded level. Right? Because vegetable oils clog it up. That's what's in our french fries, that's what's in everything, right? Refined sugars. Meats and fish are only 15.7. I mean, you can see that the real food is less than 30%, right? 
right? So by default, their inclusions displace minimally processed wild plant and animal foods. Because that's just what people had. Go for it. So what is the fourth oil you said? Palm. Okay. There can be in palm. Yeah, you got to be careful with the uh, with the source. It's got to be cold pressed. It's got to be you know. There's, but it's a, it's a better. It's still one of the better oils that our that our bodies process better. Same thing with olive oil. Like uh, the problem with some olive oils, you probably saw this come out in the news, is they were cutting it with canola oil. So a lot of the olive oils that were being sold in stores were actually not olive oil, right? So, so that that was a big. Uh, that was probably two years ago. I think that that was all over in the news. Um, Problems are that they lie to us about what's in the food. Right. Yeah, or, yeah, exactly. We're told that it doesn't matter. <laughs> so, these foods comprise 70% of the energy in our typical Western diet, but virtually were unknown in the ancient, right, in our ancestral diets. Bread, cereals, rice, pasta, dairy, refined vegetable oils, alcohol, fatty meats, added salt, refined sugars, except honey, right, <coughs> and maple syrup. <laughs> um, there's an inflection point. So this, so an inflection point is a point when things totally change, right? So we're gonna we're gonna dive back, kind of what we were talking about a little bit earlier. But this is 1960 to 2004. Now from 1960, you can see how everything was pretty flat here for those years. We could literally go all the way back, way over here. We could come all the way back here, put a hole through this wall, and keep that line going for for a long way, right? And if we did that, there's been 3,000 generations of humans. Do you think there would have been 3,000 generations of humans if we would have been living or having the increase in sickness that we have in the last 50? No. We can see this inflection point. We see pretty flat. And then when we get to 1980, what happened in 1980? things they just they just go up wow. right what happened they were flat for hundreds of thousands of years well feedlot produced meats that's not it those have been there since the 1850s refined grains in the 1980s vegetable oils you know those were in the ninth, early 1900s late 1800s hydrogenated oh oils God. those are 1900s oh high fructose corn syrup oh wow. okay so but it's made from corn. Mm -hmm. Now it's even worse, right? Because they're because we're getting the toxins too. But high fructose corn syrup, you, they, they, it's in many drinks, it's in many foods. But the problem with it is, it doesn't satisfy you. Like if you're drinking it, it doesn't it doesn't make you feel satisfied. It doesn't satiate you. It doesn't fill you. It actually makes you feel like you need to have more, right? So now that's in, and it's interesting if you go to Canada. Their Cokes, their Pepsis, they have glucose fructose, which you know is not that much better on the glycemic index, but as far as how it interacts with your hormones, is completely different, right? And so we've seen this major change in obesity, really starting around 1980, because of high fructose corn syrup, or at least that's what kind of lines up with it, right? The major changes in food industry. Hope did somebody need to take a picture? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, so that so this is what we see as far as generations. This is literally, you know, 10, yeah. wow. 10 20 generations, not 3,000, right? There was, go ahead. What, oh, and maybe you're gonna address this. Yeah. But now the, the thing is like having liquid cane sugar versus high fructose corn. It's way better because it's not, because it's real, but it's still high on the glycemic index. It's gonna right. do the same thing to your weight. Right. It's going to still be, it's not going to be healthy, but it's a better choice than high fructose corn syrup. For more reasons today than it was in 1980, until to 1996, high fructose corn syrup was just bad for our hormones and bad for our body. Now it's completely toxic, right? Because now it's got the BT, because now they're taking the corn, they're grinding it down, they're making sugars out of it, and it's also got the poisons in it. <clears throat> so sugar bondage. So we need, to, we need to really look at sugar 
especially if you want to get started as a substance abuse. Does anybody understand what happens in an alcoholic's house? What do they have to do? Yeah. Oh, I grew up in one. Yeah. You, it, so I know. It, yeah, you want to take, you want to take, the, the alcohol can't be in the house. If somebody's trying to stop, there can't be any, right? So we're, we're bondage to sugar, right? There's a sugar bondage. So what does that mean? Can you never have sugar? Yep. No, not really. But what happens is you, you have to get over it. You have to break the cycle. You have to break it. So the only way to do that is not saying, oh, on Sundays I'm going to have a cheat day. Right? It's literally stopping, not having sugar, looking what's in everything, and doing that for a month or a couple months. And then as you understand that it is bondage when you're getting into it, sugar excites the same areas of our brain that cocaine does. It's right? more, more addictive. Yeah, it's more addictive than cocaine. Every time my dad was an alcoholic, he stopped drinking. He had a drawer full of candy bars. Right. Oh. That's the only way you could do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's another, it's another addiction, right? So this is huge, right? Alcoholics know and understand that in order to stop drinking, you can't, you can't be near it. You can't have it around you, right? It's substance abuse is what sugar is. It's what it's gotten into. Because in the 50s or 60s, one, there was a, something that came out that said that the fats that were in our foods that they were flavoring our foods with was going to cause heart disease. So they started flavoring our foods with sugar, right? And so that's why we have so much sugar in all foods that we, that we have right now. Um, so you don't have it in the house. You need to understand those relationships. You need to understand where the process is going. It's a slippery slope. When you have some, you need more, right? And it, it, there's a physiologic response and reason behind that. So the top seven diet pitfalls. Drinking your calories. This is a huge one, especially with Starbucks, right? <laughs> that Frappuccino that's 700 calories, right? Their black coffee's good, but if we have too much, right? You drink your calories. This is a cocktail, right? These are the things that we, that we have on a regular basis. Drinking your calories can really get out because you don't get filled up, right? There's too, having too much fruit. What? Too much fruit? Why can you have too much fruit? Well, fruit is high in sugar, right? Fructose has the higher raisin glycemic index even than glucose does, right? So, but it's different. Like if you're having orange juice, that's not a good thing. If you're eating an orange, then it doesn't take eight, it takes almost 18 oranges to make one glass of orange juice. Right? And if you drink that, it's like mainline sugar, right? So, but if you're having the orange, you're getting some fiber, you're getting everything else with it. So some fruit is good, right? Unless you're trying to go into ketosis and then that's not gonna work. But fruit is not a bad thing, it just has to be really moderate. Um, grain or dairy, we got that, the grainitarians, these are, this is the worst one. A lot of people are vegetarians, but they just eat grains, right? Grains are not sustainable, it's grains are not, Good for so we have pasta. You know, we have pasta all the time. This is where again grain is going to turn directly into sugar, right? It's going to be high on the glycemic index. So grainitarians. This is the sandwich all the time, the pasta all the time, all of these things. Having snacks, You've got to understand what snacks do. There's basically what happens is when you have snacks, what happens is if we have a just picture a graph like on the side over here, okay? And in the morning, you wake up and your insulin levels are really low, okay? You eat and your insulin levels spike up, okay? And then they naturally start to come down like this, okay? And then if you have a snack, even if it's two almonds, it shoots this back up. And then what happens is instead of your, your insulin levels kind of decreasing and then going back up and decreasing over the day, they come up, they decrease, then they bounce up, and they decrease, and they bounce up, and so over the day, they actually end up getting higher. So, you know, those five meals a day, we end up with skinny diabetics, right? When we were teaching six, five, five, six, seven meals a day, because we're eating all the time, it's always raising the insulin level. So snacks, you gotta understand what snacks are, because, you know, we also hear this, oh, but I only eat a salad at lunchtime and a salad at dinner, and that's all I eat. But then we see all the snacks that are happening in between, yeah. right? So we got so you gotta get get our, get our minds around what snacking is and what it can be. Post exercise binging, we touched on this one, right? 
This is the one where we burn 500 calories and we drink 700, right? You've got to be careful with that. Breaking your fast the wrong way. Now, you, we used to talk about, you know, breakfast is the most, the, the most important meal of the day. But breakfast literally means break fast. So it kind of is, but when you eat it, can be can vary. I, our family, or me and Dr. Leah, we mostly intermittent fast, and we've been doing this for over three years. So for three, four, five days a week, we eat our last meal around eight o'clock at night, we eat our next meal, so our breakfast, at one o'clock the next day, right? So we just skip that breakfast. You can still have coffee, keeps your glycemic load down low, um, and it's really helpful. And we can dive a little deeper into that if that's right for you, because intermittent fasting is a very healthy way. We used to think breakfast was the most important meal, but really, what if once we can get our body untrained from this, from the high sugar, from getting hangry, because we need to have sugar in our blood all the time, then fat can sustain us for much longer. And our body can start using its own fat to burn cleaner, like natural gas, and produce ketones. So we look at breaking your fast. So breaking your fast, well, how should we break a fast? Should we have it with cereal and milk in the morning? What do you guys think after what we just learned? Probably not, right? So an avocado, some turkey bacon, some eggs, that's a great way to break a fast. Increasing fat, increasing some protein, right? Questions? Yeah, so women, so women should do that. I've, I've seen that as well. And also, some of the <coughs> some women can't do as long of an intermittent fast. Um, otherwise, their body starts going that fat storage mode. So, how would you know that about um, So the best way is to test. So um, get a blood glucose meter and a ketone meter, and then you can check both of them. So the way that Dr. Lee and I see, saw if um, bulletproof um, coffee affected our our blood glucose and our ketones is we tested right when we woke up in the morning, we drank the coffee, we tested a half hour later. If there was no change, it means that we stayed in a fasting state. Okay, oh, cool. Hmm. Um, you look like I didn't quite answer it. Yeah. So, so, the, so the collagen protein is a, su no, the, the collagen protein is a super good way because collagen protein, you can put it in your coffee because it doesn't get denatured by heat. Um, and it's super clean, easy, protein, but you can't, but it will bring most people out of the fast it's protein. Fat won't. So, so that's why. If it brings why, you out, then it's not right. Then you're, well, then it's not intermittent fasting. Okay. Then it's, then it's something different. Okay. But it's a good way to break an intermittent fast, as we call it in protein, because it's super clean and, and consistent with the way that our body for, uh, assimilates that protein. And you check ketones in the urine? Um, no, that will only check what you did yesterday. So keto meter, I've got one here, I've got one at home. It's a pinprick. Okay. So just like diabetics, we'll do a pinprick. It's the same meter, except for different strips. Um, the easiest one is Keto Mojo. So go to ketomojo.com. They've got the cheapest ones. Now you can get a cheaper one, Precision. It's only like 39 bucks on Amazon, but each of the strips are like three or four bucks. Whereas Keto Mojo, I think they're 99 cents each of the strips. Does so. insurance cover this if your doctor ordered one? I don't know. If you're a diabetic, it would cover the sugar one, but it wouldn't cover the one that does sugar and ketones. Uh, yeah. You said something about, um, like, adding a little fat to your coffee. Mm -hmm. That would be still in the fasting? Mo for most people. Some people it's not. So that's where we, we tested. So what we add is we had um, one tablespoon of butter, okay. and then one tablespoon of MCT oil, which is a coconut-based oil, mm -hmm. um, and then we blend it. And so you can test that. Some people will raise, some people will lower. Some people, once you've been intermittent fasting for a little while and you test it again, then it, you'll stay in a fasting state. So it just depends on how sensitive you are. Which one is the best uh, timing to, to eat? Or what do you feel like? Between your meals? It, does, it, it, it varies. And if you're intermittent fasting, the way that we do it is if we fast for 16 hours, I eat as much food as I can in eight hours. This so. is Well, with intermittent fasting, it's not so much because you're just gonna be raising during that eight hours. With regular eating, it's mostly kind of splitting it up three, four hours apart. You're not concerned about calories in that eight hour spread? Either? No. 
Um, less concerned because most of the time, what's going to happen is you're just not good. You're not going to be able to get them in. Yeah. Hmm. What's that? <laughs> I said you'd be surprised. Right. Yeah. How many calories you yeah. can get yeah. in? But but right, if you're eating the way that we're talking about, right? <laughs> yeah. And you're eating good foods, your body's going to be your body's going to assimilate them. It's going to take care of them. You know, the overeating part, we've got to be careful at one sitting, but you know, you could sit down and have a three hour meal that where you're not consuming a ton of calories, but it's, you know, you're having, you're, you're having some wine, you're having meat, you know, you're going through the process, right? What, yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so um, bonfire, correct. So unlimited, so this is kind of the baseline, right? This is what I want you to commit to memory. Unlimited vegetables, <laughs> unlimited vegetables, abundant, lean, natural meats. Some fruit, nuts and seeds, limited starch and no sugar, right? This is paleo correct. This is part of an overall lifestyle too, right? So why paleo? So you committed me. I said to commit to memory, not to your phone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Where do beans fall? Um, beans are beans are natural. They're they're good. It depends on how your body hangs with them. They're going to be a little bit. They're going to be the limited starchy stuff. Yeah. I think using an instant pot too, with beans helps with. Um, Breaking them down. Yeah. It starts to digest them early. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even if you put a little bit of uh, uh, apple cider vinegar in with them, then it really helps. With like the black beans work best. Yeah. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. Most for most people, everybody's a little bit different. So why paleo? Our genes dictate what our nutritional needs are. Our genes were shaped over time by environmental experience, right? 3,000 generations of human. The first time that brains were introduced is 10,000 years ago. Our body has not evolved at that point for that. So our bodies don't know how to accept those. Up until 500 generations ago and 2.5 million years before that, all humans ate the same diet. Different in some senses because some people lived in Scandinavia and some people lived on the equator, right? <laughs> but but we lived off foods from the land, right? No evidence of ancestral degenerative diseases. The agricultural revolution changed all of that. So what does paleo look like? Kind of what we just talked about. Unlimited, take a picture of this one too. Uh, unlimited non-starchy vegetables. So good carbs, right? No refined grains, the bad carbs are the fast carbs. Plenty of fruit and berries relatively high animal protein, moderate amounts of good fat, high in fiber, high in potassium, low in sodium, net alkaline load, rich in phytochemicals, vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants. What is the zone diet? So zone diet's good too, because it's really trying to teach you to stay in certain areas, right? So we wanna say it's very similar to paleo in the food choice options, but we're doing 40% carbs, 30% carbs, uh, protein 30% fat so we're getting a little bit and when you do keto keto is the same as paleo it's just higher in fat right so you're looking at like 60% of your calories from fat is what is what's ideal with keto um, and then we go down in um, carbohydrates and then in the protein and everybody's just a little bit different on that too so where's the plants the fats and the protein this is what we want to look at our at our at our plate to be Right? You can eat like a king or a queen with this, right? There's great food, great scrambles with kale, tomatoes, you know, sausages. I don't think that would be very clear. <clears throat> so different kinds of food. Now I'm gonna make you real hungry. <laughs> right? Um, almond flour pancakes with some blackberries. What do we got? Seared ahi with some greens and some mangoes and some peppers and some kale and some uh, and some tomatoes. There are lots of good choices. The food that's, that, that we have available is amazing. You know, our ancestors didn't have it available so that they could have this all the time, right? We do, we can make good choices. Swedish meatballs. So lots of good stuff. So do's, non-starchy vegetables, some fruit, meat, poultry, fish, range-fred eggs, <clears throat> natural fats, some nut seeds, and then drink lots of water. Don'ts, refined carbohydrates, cereal grains, sweeteners, bad vegetable oils, dairy products, soda, juice, and alcohol. So again, exceptions, avocado, olive, palm, and coconut oils. The perfect storm. So now we look at sedentary lifestyle, right? 
So we talked about the toxic food choices. So wild human in captivity, right? We look at the humans living today inherited a genome that was programmed for daily physical activity and a high fiber diet, right? What causes elevated insulin, right? We talked about the sugars, the refined carbohydrates, the fast carbs, the dairy, the energy imbalances, so too many calories, sedentary lifestyle, under moving, right? So that's what we're gonna get into. So I'll just work it off at the gym. This is a big one, and this is something that I've learned because in practice for before I said, yeah, let's, let's start working out and lose some weight. I have been proven wrong a thousand times. The gym doesn't make you lose weight. It helps you change body composition, but we have energy balance needs, so caloric intake needs, intake and output, hormonal impact, support hard training and lean muscle, but not fat. So this is what exercise does, right? So we're gonna look at the energy balance economy. So our genes are thrifty. Our genes, this means that we can take in food and we can use it for energy, but our body's gonna be very reluctant to give up fat. This means that we have a furnace that we have to stoke, right? But it's gonna use very little energy to get the energy done that it needs to. So we need to have this ability of our body to, to burn fat. But we can go and exercise, like I said, you might exercise for a half hour, 45 minutes, and you only burn five or 600 calories, right? Like I said, that could be done in a three minute drink. So very easy to consume calories. This is what we're talking about, those drinks, right? Very difficult to burn them, right? You will never out-train a lousy diet. That's where it all starts, literally. 30% in the gym, 70% diet. I would actually say 80 to 90% diet, 10 to 20% in the gym. Abs are made in the kitchen, not in the gym, right? So this is, this is a big one to really wrap our heads around. Food is more important than exercise, but moving is equally important for health. Exercise is critical for achieving optimum health. Correcting, metabol and me correcting the metabolic derangement. So our ancestors exerted themselves daily, right? To secure their food, their water, their protection. Although modern technology has made physical exertion optional, it's still important to exercise as though our survival depended on it. And in a different way, it still really does, right? <clears throat> because what, if we wanted to eat, we had to go out, we had to get our water from the watering hole, we had to go out, we had to hunt, we had to gather, we had to get all of our food, right? So it always created that ability of us to get out and do things. Rebalance hormones with exercise. So only exercise on days that you eat. <laughs> Good job, Molly, thanks. <laughs> okay, exertion is key. So exerting yourself, right? We wanna make sure that we're sweating, that you're moving, that you're panting, 30 minutes. Doesn't matter what you do. Do what moves you, figuratively and literally. Just do what you want to do. Literally, they did a study, um, and I'm just forgetting some of the details, but they, they did a study where they had people walk, and this was for depression, but same kind of idea. They had people walk 20 minutes a day, five days a week, and it was more effective treatment for depression than, than any of the psychotropic drugs, right? You probably know the stats on that. But it was, they're, they're on an exam, but I have to take it again. <laughs> so the perfect storm. So we look at social stress too, right? We gotta touch on some of these things because these are things that we don't think about, we don't, that aren't out there, and these things affect us huge. Chronic, chronic psychological stress and sleep deprivation are going to affect cortisol, right? I'm gonna test you guys again. So what happens with insulin? That's right. That's All right, wrong. good job, okay. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about cortisol. So cortisol um, helps, help, cortisol kind of wakes us up. It's kind of like adrenaline, it's precursor to adrenaline, right? Precursor gets up our heart rate, does a lot of different things. So what we're gonna talk about next is big line number five. Sleep's got nothing to do with it, right? Well, sleep has a lot to do with it. And this is a big issue because starting in the 1600s when Paris became the city of light. You know why it became the city of light? Electricity. No, before electricity. Because it was the first place where they were burning torches to light halls, to light castles, to light homes. 
That's how it got the name the City of Light. So sleep's got nothing to do with it. That's when our circadian rhythms started to get thrown off. And today, they're worse than ever. So sleep deprivation, cortisol cycles, they're generally low in the evening, right? We need to wind down and get tired. They're high in the morning, right? This is why more people have heart attacks first thing in the morning because it's when our cortisol levels are up, our hearts, it's trying to kind of kick, kick start us going for the day. We have unnatural schedules. We have unnatural lighting. We see, when we look at this, we really understand kind of how, because when we didn't have lights, when did we go to bed? When it got dark, and when did we wake up? When it got light, right? Um, but now we have lights on the inside. We couldn't tell if it's light or dark here in a casino in, in Las Vegas, right? And in many of our homes. So we really start to change the effectiveness of what happens because even through the, through the summertime, our body, as the days start getting shorter, we start getting the signal that hibernation time is coming. We need to start packing on and we need to get that insulin up right? Because we want to start packing and storing some of our food for through the winter. So that if we need to fast, then it's available for us to do that, right? So we look at best practices using these because we got to think about these. Optimum sleeping is usually eight to nine hours for most people. I say seven to nine hours, right? There's great apps that you can do that kind of track this if you're a geek like me. So I've been tracking my sleep. I don't know Dr. Leah, how many days? I think like over 600 days or over 700 days. And I average about seven hours of, of sleep. So we look at using circadian rhythms as a guide, right? This is, more, this is morning and, and night and using that as a guide. Getting eight to nine hours of sleep, you need a quiet, dark, and comfortable room. You know, in the summertime, in the Northwest, we kind of have to go to sleep have to make ourselves go to sleep because it doesn't get dark until 10 and it's light at 4.30 or 5, especially at this time of year. And e-fast, this is a huge one and it's a hard one with kids and, and us ourselves because looking at our phone, just looking at our phone, the blue light from our phone changes and makes our brains think that we're in daylight, right? So there are certain apps that you can do. Um, there's settings on the iPhone where you can triple tap the power button and it will turn it red. Um, so there's different things you can do. You can get night, you can get blue blocker glasses, different things like that when you're on your computer. Um, make it a household culture. Have a place where electronics go at a certain time of the night, right? So eat more, sleep more, have more sex. We can do this, right? Right. Okay. Do you know anybody? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I'm a grad school guy. <laughs> so, Given the ineffectiveness of popular weight loss diets, adoption of a healthy lifestyle is more appropriate for winning the war against chronic disease, right? So what, is this, what does this say? It's saying that, hey, don't plan on being skinny next week, but the changes that you make today, even, and my purpose today was to hopefully help you make a shift, right? To make a shift, to understand that there's a different way than what we're being bombarded with in the media, right? Because it's not the right way. We need to understand where we came from. We need to understand how our bodies function and work. And once we do that, the choices become a little bit easier. And once we can get off the sugar, right, then it gets a little bit easier from there. Because we don't understand until you start looking how much sugar is in. So these are the different resources, right? The paleo diet, bonfire health, CrossFit, performance menu, Mark's Daily App is a really good one for ketogenic. Paleo cookbooks, paleo diet. So these are all good resources to look at some of these um, places for how our bodies are supposed to live, right? So what we wanna do is, uh, is answer any questions that you all have. I'm was really happy with how many questions you guys had along the way. Um, what we also wanted to offer is we're doing a consultation, 15 minutes to a half an hour consultation. Um, where we'll sit down, go over what your objectives are. Remember, we talked about objectives first. Go over objectives and see what the right thing is for you. Um, we've got different ways to detox and also just diet starters that we can work with. True Sailor Detox is kind of the, the top of that. We have a 21-day detox. There's many different things, but the place where we want to start is to just sit down and understand where you're at, 
where you are on your journey, what your goals are, whether it's to get better performance, whether it's to lose weight, whether it's to be more healthy, and really understand what that is. So what we did is we made some appointments available for that over the next three weeks. So if you want to sit down and talk over what your goals are, um, it's $27 for that half hour. And we're just going to talk down and see what's going on. We're going to give you some actionable items to be able to do and uh, hopefully give you some solutions. So talk with Demi is going to get that scheduled for you if anybody's interested in that. Um, and I would definitely talk to her. You know, procrastination is the thief of health, right? Waiting on some things like, oh, I'll do it next time or I'll do it later because that time just passes us by, right? So think about the things that we talked about tonight when you go home and remember this. The battle is won at the cash register, not at the fridge door, right? Because when you open the fridge door and Ben and Jerry's is in there, neither Ben nor Jerry is gonna have a hard time convincing you to eat it, right? <laughs> but if it's at the store, it's a lot harder to go and get, right? So the battle is won at the cash register. So start thinking about that. And then talk with Demi. You guys have a great night and hopefully uh, we're making some changes in the morning. This over here, so this will text you a video that talks about the True Sailor Detox. So there's one for weight loss resistance. So these are people who have tried to lose weight and can't. There's sleep and anxiety, low energy and brain fog and chronic pain. So there's different videos that will get um, sent to you. Okay. So we've got a raffle to do. So tonight we're raffling off a Greens First. So Greens First is one of my favorite supplements. What's that? Green. It could be Greens or Reds. Oh, Greens or Reds. So greens or reds, they're, they're the equivalent serving of 15 fruits or vegetables, and they're not sweetened. They have stevia in them. So um, I'm going to let you choose one and then read the last four numbers. 5416. I'm one of the last Is it you? You got it? You're good. <laughs> Good job. Wow. Magnetic. That's awesome. Can't say that tomorrow. Yeah. 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 Yeah.